Zen. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. I just want to begin with a short introduction about what People Hum is, if that's okay. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for Etsyum that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 15,000 visitors a month and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest of today, Suzanne, a short introduction on Suzanne. She is a global expert in proven strategic marketing and communications lead on strategic initiatives for corporations, startups, nonprofits, and the community. Suzanne's most recent project is Mindful Mornings Miami, the hottest new one-hour talk show on independent short radio. With a reach of over 200,000, the show focuses on what it means to wake up and live in the world today. So welcome, Suzanne. We're thrilled to have you on our series. Awesome to be here and welcome to everyone. And my first wish is that everyone is awake, aware, and well today. Thank you so much for that. So let me begin with the first question I have for you, Suzanne. So, you know, you have worked extensively in media, satellite television, brand marketing, uh, communication. So what is it that attracted you to mindfulness as an enabler in organizations? You know, my experience of uh, living in one place and working on pretty much every continent on the planet Uh, really made me aware that I was always in kind of autopilot. I was always on. Uh, The media tends to do that, both in the way that it bombards us with media information and messaging. And I found that I personally was really being the same way. And so in that regard, for me, mindfulness became a way to really get present to what was going on, both wherever I happen to be on the planet for my GPS location, but also where my head and my mind and my body are located. The most recent Harvard study actually shows that 47% of the time that we are out of bed and awake and vertical, our mind and our body are actually not in the same place. We spend more than 50% of our time thinking about the past, ruminating about what happened, what happened, what happened, or projecting into the future. And when we project into the future, we create anxiety. And when we ruminate about the past, we create and experience depression. We are not particularly attuned as human beings um, to be present right where we are right now. And I experienced in my my global work that I was doing, I experienced a series of uh, panic attacks because I was anxiety ridden and I was kind of anxiety driven. And I started to realize that if I didn't have a practice like this, I was not going to be present to my life. And truthfully told, I might not even be here if I had not learned how to slow my roll. Oh, I see. That is quite insightful. Uh, It's very interesting to understand how people actually think about more of the past than of the future. And thank you for that. So can you tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing with organizations and what do they typically struggle with? So what I'm noting is kind of a, I'm going to call it pre-coronavirus answer to that question, post-coronavirus answer to that question. So instead of BC and AD, I'm going to call it PC, pre and post. I'm noting that before coronavirus showed up as a global pandemic and impacted how we work, a lot of really forward thinking companies were starting to notice that their own staff was feeling a lot of overwhelm, like people were feeling like they were up here with expectation. So that before coronavirus, companies were putting productivity at the top of the hierarchy of what they expected from employees. Now it seems that post and during coronavirus, that the well-being of employees are taken a at least an equal measure to productivity. And I'm going to project that post-coronavirus, well-being is going to literally end up being the most important uh, aspect at work. In terms of the clients I work with, 
a lot of them were making very bold decisions to care for mental health and the focus and attention skills of their employees. I see, I see. All right, so I think um, at least we know what's going to be the single most important factor going forward after coronavirus is settled out. That is quite insightful. So how do you believe the workplace is going to evolve in the future and what will organizations need to focus on and what is being termed as the future of work? So I really think that this is my own belief system that being human at work actually works. And I'm going to share a little philosophy that I believe when the Industrial Revolution began and basically put human beings into a cog on a wheel uh, at the level of productivity, that according to Milton Friedman, economist, existed purely and only for the sole purpose of earning an investment, an ROI, a return on investment, and that it was only and wholly responsible to its shareholders, I believe that this experience we're in is going to break apart a lot of what that structure and raison d'etre, reason of being, of what work is about and why work matters and also how work fits into the human experience. And I do believe that that shift of, yes, companies are still gonna have to make a profit, but if you look at the cutting edge research and management uh, styles that are coming out of Harvard School and Stanford and other varying institutions like the Wellbeing Center at the London School of Economics, so some of the most leading institutions on the planet, you're noting that well-being, health, is becoming a priority. You take a look at New Zealand and for the first time in human history, you actually have a minister that has put the well-being of people at the top of their economic focus over necessarily GDP. And so I do believe we're living in a very interesting time that the topic of the future of work is going to fit into being human. It's going to fit into life at home. It's going to fit into how we are well enough to be able to be productive with our wellness and productivity really being on equal measure. And I also think this topic of what we're doing now too is going to, because past the pandemic, we're going to figure out really much more conscious ways of connecting with each other because we have to socially distance, human beings are wired in our minds and in our bodies to be with one another. So we're gonna develop a real hunger to wanna be in the presence of other beings. And I think that even that part of work will be about being able to have social connection. You know, research shows that loneliness and isolation kills. So work may end up being a part of the element that provides connection when we're all able to be back in the same physical space with one another. And we as human beings need it. We literally need to be connected. You know, if you look at some of the living wisdom that is out there, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, the Vietnamese uh, Buddhist teacher, he talks about the fact that not only are we interconnected, he calls it interbeing. And if you look at ancient wisdom, such as the Ubuntu philosophy in South Africa, Ubuntu, when translated, means I am a person because of other people. I am because you are. So the belief becomes what happens to someone in China impacts me in Miami. And so much of what this is breaking through is our sensations of separation and, and separateness. And we're really realizing, wow, how well you are, I, 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 Rasha, in India matters to me because it matters. So I really think that the future of work is going to be tied very directly to being human at work and allowing people to say, I have a sick child I need to care for. I really do believe that this time in um, unprecedented times of human history, that we are going to find out that being well and being human is going to be the future of work. 
And I really believe that that future will put as a priority, not only am I well enough to work, but that my work is going to work with me to be able to be at work. And so I think that, that we are watching um, a great shift take place right now about the future of work. I absolutely agree. It's, um, you know, the shift is from business centricity to actually people centricity, yes. you know, and at the end, we're all social beings. Humans are social beings. So uh, it's important that you talk about the well-being of the core of any organization, right? Yes. I mean, they even talk about it, if anyone's familiar here in your listenership, with what's called human-centered design. So in the startup space, you use human-centered design as a way to solve a problem. Because you put the human at the middle of the problem, you don't create a product and then push it out into the marketplace and tell why they have a need. Instead, you flip the script and you put the human at the center of the problem. You ask what is it that they actually are seeking and you design the solution around the human with the challenge. Wow, that is, that's great thinking. And that is, I think, revolutionary in a sense. And it will change a lot in the coming future. Absolutely. I think so. Yes. So the next question I have is, uh, how does employee experience design need to change to include aspects of particularly mindfulness? So I'm going to give you what I call good news, the geek that I am, because I absolutely love mindfulness. It really has saved my life, to be honest. Share with you that the news I received, because I'm getting my master's degree right now in mindfulness. Who knew you could? But I am. I'm, I'm nine months away from completing my degree in mindfulness at the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. So it's a very fascinating program based on neuroscience and fMRI results and EEGs. So all of that kind of um, brainiac kind of, of, of physiology-based science. I really believe that um, what China just announced, I've heard through the grapevine, is they are recommending mindfulness meditation practices to all Chinese citizens. Because when you learn the practices of how to slow your roll, you actually build immunity into your immune system and one of the biggest things that no one has done, whether it's at work or whether it's in your personal life, no one's handed us a little instruction manual that says, hey, this means to be human. Did you know, for example, that you have five basic emotions as a human and you can express them in 500 different ways? You know, did you know that when you aren't breathing properly, you actually send your body into an experience of called fight, flight, or freeze. Did you know that if I take my elbow and I have you do this with me, so put your hand up and do this with me, Raoya, this is your adrenal glands. This is at the top of your keys. This is your spine, okay? Fold your thumb into your palm. This is the amygdala back here. It's the oldest part of your brain. It's called the primal part of the brain. It's called the reptilian part of the brain. Fold your fingers over the front. This is the prefrontal cortex, the most evolved mammalian part of the brain. When you're not breathing well, or you're in an adrenaline addicted moment, or you're in one of those, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I can't think straight. Go like this. Put your lid. You just flipped your lid. And when you flip your lid, you lose all of your executive, logical, rational function, like how to make a good decision under deadline, how to make a decision to pivot if you are making a, a business decision that you've lost money in a market. So wow. what, happen, what happens if you learn mindfulness with the science, one of the ways you learn how to bring yourself back online is called the anti-anxiety breath. So you take a dignified seat, sit very calmly in your seat, drop your shoulders back a little, lift the heart cage just a little, breathe in through the nose for a count of six, hold for one, push out like a straw for a count of eight. Take the turn, breathe in again through a count of six through the nose, 
Hold for one, push out like a straw. Do another one on your own, in for six. Hold for one, push out like a straw. If you flipped your lid, I just helped you start to bring your prefrontal cortex back online. What I just did by teaching you the anti-anxiety breath is your nervous system has two parts. One's called the sympathetic. The other part is called the parasympathetic. Your sympathetic nervous system doesn't have sympathy for you. It's actually all your autonomic functions, your breathing, your digestion is also save you if a car is about to run you over. It will send you in to fight, flight, freeze. Your parasympathetic will actually instead calm you down. And what that does, what we just did is like a parachute and it brings you back down to earth and it takes that activated system, curls all of that and you come right here back online. Interestingly enough, nobody gave you an instruction manual. Nobody's taught you how to be human. We're in this really interesting moment that the techniques and the tips of mindfulness that not only can help us at work, can help us be more human and help us work through major difficulty. Because here's, for example, the interesting experience. The three of us that are on this call right now are in two places that are hot spots on the planet. We could be really activated in this state of nervousness, but in this moment, right now, by having done that breath, in this moment, we're actually okay. And Mark Twain said something, the American author said something really interesting. My life has been full of difficult moments, most of them which never happened. Because most of them happen up. Most of them don't really happen, and they are mostly made up in our mind that, you know, and, and I'm not trying to at all minimize the people who have lost someone. I'm by no means trying to delude anyone that these are very sobering times. But when we know how to be able to create a practice to slow ourselves, we can actually just at least help ourselves be more calm through whatever storm or however big the wave is that we might be experiencing. Wow, that is very fascinating. So um, how important of a role will technology and digital make in the inclusive workplace of the future? You know, I'm really today, not only because we're talking from Miami to India, I'm really thankful for technology and digital. You know, I'm really struck that I, here I am, a, a, a former global TV executive, you know, who worked in a very, um, I've worked for the Gates Foundation in Ethiopia, Vietnam, Bangladesh. Here I am, technically a mindfulness meditation teacher who's figured out a way to talk about the neuroscience and really the uh, biological benefits of a attention training practice. And who knew that this would actually be the time for my business to take off because of digital technology? You know, who knew that our opportunity to stay connected as humans when we have to socially distance each other is a blessing that digital and technology exist? Um, I do believe that not only are we going to push all the limits of the internet, we're going to push our limits of how do we work differently? How do we uh, connect virtually? I think between you and I, that is only being redone. I think there's a new human coming through this and work will become um, this beautiful way and means that we build new lives and it will be based entirely on the fact that digital and technology are going to help us get there. It's quite an interesting perspective. And yeah, I think uh, it's, it's technology that's going to kind of bind us, um, you know, together in a very different, in a very new age way. Yeah. I agree with you on that.
All right. Uh, next question is, how do you believe the gig economy is going to evolve? Um, and especially when you consider the growing ranks of millennials in our workforce, how do you think they're going to evolve? So I'm, I'm, um, I'm obviously not a millennial. I'm right on the edge of baby boom and Gen X. So in transparency, I can share that's where I'm at. Um, I'm really intrigued the, the fact that, that for whatever reason, because I've been both a corporate person and I'm, I'm a, a crazy entrepreneur, I absolutely love being an entrepreneur. I really think that I do relate, while that is not my, my birth age, but I relate a lot to the gig economy and the millennial mindset because I teach a lot in startup spaces. I actually teach an entire program, Be a Mindful Entrepreneur. Because to be an entrepreneur, which means you're in the gig economy, um, when you're brave enough, word in French, entrepreneur, means to take a risk, to have a pretty assured chance you won't succeed and choose to do it anyway. And that's definitely me. Um, one of the things I think that is going to happen in terms of the gig economy that we are living in or millennials or like me, a baby boomer, Gen X, kind of right on the edge. I really think that people are going to find new ways to realize that they have skills and services that they can offer to employers. I think people are going to get creative. You know, I trust in the human spirit. We've been through very different things. We've made it through two wars. You know, human um, experience has through uh, the bubonic plague, we've made it to the other side of many other things. I think it's really important to remember this is not the end of the story. You know, I don't know what that will be, but I do trust, and the human spirit itself is full of innovation. You know, just as much as the coronavirus is capable of remutating itself, humanity is also very smart. So the way that work is being rebuilt and I think reordered will put humans at the center of that equation with well-being as a priority. You know, in the times before, if you had, let's say, lost a pet the day before you had to do a big meeting, go into work and that day be really challenged and carrying a lot on your shoulders and trying not to tell anyone about it. I think what's going to happen and I've seen companies already do this. Lulu, for example, has something at the beginning of a meeting that everybody for one minute has something called a clearing. And you say what it is that's on your shoulders. You speak it out loud and you say, so today I'm a little worried because my friend is sick. Or today I'm a little sad because my kitty passed away. Or today I'm really excited because I'm about to hear from the bank that I, I put an offer in on a house and we'll see if they finance it. In the gig economy, I think it's really important to note that I think that whether we're getting creative about the skills we bring to a current job or whether or not we start to actually go out on our create a side hustle, I think we're reaching a stage where we're going to really be able to incorporate being human at work and that work is going to work for humans. The future of work is going to be a balanced symbiotic relationship than just, I must do this for my employer. I think employers are going to find the call for flexibility is going to be a mutual call, whether it's in the gig economy or with a regular structured workspace. Absolutely. And I think because as uh, humanity has solved the first few levels of Maslow's hierarchy, now we are kind of, you know, going to the higher order and the self-actualization part of it, uh, which I think also includes uh, the well-being and, um, you know, the, the really the love and the care that we want to get as humans. Yes. Right? Very so absolutely. Nice. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and as a brand builder and marketeer, what is your recommendation on areas to focus on while building a talent brand? So I really think that um, because work is going to be about humans, I think one of the most interesting things about building a brand around talent, while there's a huge necessity for the um, sense of AI and learning to really offer um, a lot of the way forward, I think one of the most 
important things is that AI will never be human. And being able to put the human aspect into a brand that is leveraging AI, leveraging machine learning as a for good way to solve or create solutions, I still think that the most important thing, because anytime I work with an entrepreneur, I ask right off the bat, what is the pain point or the problem that you solve? And around the pain point or the problem that you solve, once you've identified that, is what is your point of differentiation? And especially for brands that are really learning and leaning into the tech space, the part of it that is still the best point of differentiation I believe possible is being human. Because wow. the aspect of what he, we still literally don't understand higher human experience. For the first time in history, the Dalai Lama funded something called the Atlas of Emotions. So we are at a time in space in 2020 where we have cartography maps that were created, whether it was by Amerigo Vespucci, whether it was by Leif Erikson, you know, I'm specifically speaking of someone who came from the, 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 the European continent over to the American continent, and we could name the Polynesians, we could name all sorts of other people who have been explored on the geographic, uh, physical space of the planet, where we have not yet got that kind of expertise is the cartography of the inner life. And I think we've reached a stage where when you've got the Dalai Lama actually commissioning money to create the first ever Atlas of Emotions, we're now beginning to understand or at least look at what does this mean to actually have five basic emotions and 500 expressions of those emotions. I, could, I have sat in front of a client that runs one of the largest academic institutions for uh, community colleges in the United States in front of a room of psychologists, and I've asked them, do you know how many uh, um, expressions of emotions the human experience contains? Most of them don't know. And they're trained in psychology. So we're entering a new space in, in art and I really do believe that that's going to impact every element of life of which work is going to be in the pie of how we make up our lives. Two great big, big chunks have been pieces of that pie and one of them has been sleep and another piece of that pie has been work. I really believe that that pie is about to shift. Right. And I also believe that if we solve the emotion part of it, if we concentrate more on emotions, uh, I think we will we'll be able to solve a lot of issues that we are facing, you know, um, the whole anxiety part of it, the depression part of it, um, just by communicating about this and being more vocal about emotions, uh, I think that would really, really help us solve a lot of those issues. You know, I'm coming to find out with my, clients that what you just talked about is called emotional intelligence and then I've got a phrase I've made up called emotional fluency so there are some people who might be able to speak several languages like I speak Spanish I speak a little bit of French and fala portuguese hablo español perfectamente bien y je parle un peu de français but what I'm realizing is what you just said which is my journey into becoming a mindfulness trainer is about learning how to not only feel my feelings, but name them, claim them, and them. And in most of the world, we've been taught not to feel our feelings. I grew up in a family that is very German, very Dutch, and very English, even though I grew up in America. And we had a phrase that was called grin and bury. And that was considered to be a way to be just smile through anything and push down what it is you're feeling because you were not allowed to express it, nor were you feel it. I do believe the time we're in of emotional intelligence and social intelligence is an upgrade because you now actually have government officials talking about how well people are, talking about how well 
we are. We're actually stepping into a time where we're experiencing the human experience. That is the path to healthfulness, which will then lead us to what we do for wellness and wealthfulness. And that really means we need to be present. We need to be mindful and we need to be heartful. Absolutely, absolutely. It's time we actually take health very seriously because that will be your wealth in, in its true sense. And I agree with you, absolutely. And, and, and I, think, I think kindness is becoming the new currency. Be kind in, in the middle of being squeezed, either where I live, work, or what I have to eat, or do I have enough toilet paper? And yet, can I still choose to be kind? Can I choose living kindness to another being because I have no idea what that'll be? And I think this is just cracked open our capacity for compassion in a way that humanity has never experienced before. Yes, and kindness is free of cost. Why don't you use it to, you know, help other people? Yeah. What does it take? Yes, that's true. And coming to the last question that I have for you, with the recent outbreak of the coronavirus, how do you think our way of life and work will change once we come out of this crisis? I would love to tell you I have the answers. I don't. Um, there's a practice, system, a Zen, the Zen practice called I Don't Know Mind, where you literally learn how to cultivate I don't know. And there's really interesting freedom that happens when you can get to the point of going, I really don't know. And, and, and our choice so often um, from the poet, quote, Rumi, of wanting to be right, we have this thing, we wanna be right. And we get really attached to being right. And we assign a lot of meaning to being right. Rumi says there is a field out beyond right doing and wrong doing. I will meet you there. So what if we dropped off right, wrong? What if we stepped onto the field of I don't know? And it's interesting that when you look at things like quantum physics, you look at things like, and fill in the blank, whether you have a spiritual practice or not, but with someone, all things are possible. Like with trust, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. With curiosity, all things are possible. With I don't know mind, all things are possible. I think we sit at a time where we can choose or to consciously, mindfully, very presently come through this, or we can choose chaos. We can choose the Mad Max version of, you know, everybody fighting for whatever is left. And humanity stands at an inflection point, a tipping point of our choose the better angels of our nature or not. And I think it depends, interestingly enough, on my individual choices. And then really fascinatingly, if I stay healthy, and I stay socially distant, me not, even if I'm not sick, me not getting someone else sick literally could save someone else's life. So my wellness truthfully impacts the well being of another person, and my illness also does. And when you look at the word illness and you look at the word wellness, the only difference is I or we. And I literally think that that tiny, subtle inflection point, L-N-E-S-S, -S, that's the same. The difference between illness and the difference between wellness is the difference between I and we. And it's right in front of our faces. So do I make this about me? Or do I actually stand in this moment of transformation individually and collectively and make a choice for the we? And, and, and that's where I believe I'm at. I'm offering what I do as a mindfulness trainer. I've got some people wanting me to do an hour long free Zoom class. I've got other people who I've trained with 
um, in real life, IRL, who have said, Suzanne, can I buy a six pack of classes from you for one hour every week for the next six weeks? My team needs you to teach them how to breathe again. My team needs to understand what it means to be human. And I'm now myself in the entrepreneurial space of offering my mindful way of being human, which is being human 101. Um, who knew that I was supposed to go through what I did, which was anxiety and panic attacks and ending up in the ER, as put my tush on a cush, learned mindfulness and attention training, and be able to be of use and be of service. And in that, I basically say thank you. Thank you for the difficulty I had so I can help other people navigate the storm because I know how to sit. And in the middle of the storm, it's a radical act to just sit, to just be. And, and to remember also, we've gotten confused in thinking we're human doings, and the word is actually human being. And when I miss the do or the be, you know, where I've got people going, oh my gosh, I, I'm at home and I, I, I have time you know, to like clean the garage or clean out a closet, my child, like, wow, what a gift. you have a chance to be, what a gift. Absolutely, I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I think it's amazing that you're doing something which will support people in getting better and actually realizing that as humans, we've forgotten to be human in all of what we're doing. We're just so task oriented and narrow minded that we've forgotten how to live and breathe and enjoy moments that would take your breath away. Yeah. And I, I think uh, people like you really, really help us to get to that point where we need to understand how to just calm down and to breathe right in all the chaos amidst all the chaos that's going on and thank you so much for that You're very welcome and i am thrilled because this caused us to have a new connection and a new friendship and i'm honored in any way that i might be able to help people hum or anything else please feel free to reach out stay in touch and let me know how i might be able to be of service because i'm really real um i'll confess a little moment at the end of this there was a life I actually considered going into the ministry um, and I ended up finding out that I had this call that if anything was much more interested in every version of the wisdom that's out there and so instead I'm realizing wow I'm kind of a, um, a modern day mystic that helps people how to be human it's 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 a different version and it's how I'm meant to serve so thank you for the opportunity and may everyone literally uh, be awake and, and be aware, be well, and just be, just be.